or okay so we talked about you being what being a nurse practitioner means um so let's talk specifics about pediatrics uh, i'm telling you okay all right so pediatrics and primary care so what do we do as PMPs in primary care? Well, we treat children and their caregivers um, from birth all the way to 26 years of age. Um, so that's our, our span um, for uh, the population that we see. As a PMP in primary care, you can really work in a lot of different places, more even than what's listed here. Most of our students go on to work in primary care pediatric offices or what people call doctor's offices or private practices. Um, so most do end up doing that, um, but there are some who choose to go maybe in public health settings, working maybe with the health department um, or school-based health clinics. Um, I have a recent graduate who works in a school-based health center right now here in the Atlanta area as a PNP. Um, and then a lot to also go into subspecialty practices. There are some that really work well with your training in primary care. <clears throat> so what do you do? Um, all day long, uh, a lot. It's like get your roller skates out and dust it off because you will be moving 24 seven. I oftentimes hear students that say, oh, I was thinking about pediatric primary care, but everybody tells me I'll be bored. I'm really waiting for a boring day. I haven't had one yet. And I've been a PMP since 2001. So for quite a long time, um, there really aren't boring days. You are seeing a ton of patients every day and you are moving, moving, moving a ton of variety, anything can walk in that door and almost anything does. Um, so you are seeing kids that are well, that are there for their checkups, you're doing their developmental screenings, making sure they're on, on track. Um, you're doing really in-depth physical exams on those kids. Uh, you even do sports physicals on kids who student athletes who come in and need that paperwork filled out. Um, you go beyond the paperwork obviously, and really address their needs as an athlete, as a student athlete. You're keeping people healthy by providing immunizations. You're also seeing children who are acutely ill with a variety of things on a variety of spectrums. Um, I've had kids who come in just for an ear recheck. They had an ear infection two weeks ago. They just wanna make sure it's cleared all the way to a child and everyone that has left for lunch except for me and the mom's carrying this kid in who's limping down the hallway who can't breathe because he's having a major asthma attack. So you see all of that and anything in between. Um, so uh, a lot of acute illness is what you'll see, but then you also have kids who have chronic conditions. And while they may be seeing a specialist for their diabetes with regards to their diabetes care, that specialist has no idea how to treat an ear infection or how to treat pneumonia or how to address the developmental delays that that child is having. So you are still really needed in addition, they will be seeing you probably more frequently than they'll be seeing their specialists. So you're checking in on what their blood sugars are looking at, looking like. Are they checking their urine for ketones? What do they do when they have strep throat and their blood sugars start going really wacky, right? So you're there to kind of help with that as well. Talking a lot with the specialist um, and managing the care, the specialty care together, but those kids also have to have regular care as well. And then you're providing a lot of education, not just to parents, but to kids as well um, on things, uh, regular things like what, what should toddlers be eating? How do you get them to eat more than chicken fingers, right? So just talking to them about that um, as well. Um, in addition, uh, we were doing behavioral health before the pandemic, but it's certainly a bigger need now. Um, you're, as a primary care clinician, you're the front line. So you're, these kids are coming in um, and many were having issues before the pandemic started, but it certainly has exacerbated those issues. Um, they're coming in, you're making, you're doing the assessments, you're making the diagnosis. And typically, honestly, now in pediatric primary care, you're initiating the treatment. Um, so that means you might be initiating treatment with antidepressants for a child and maybe doing some counseling as well uh, for these kids because it's really hard right now to get in to get a to see a mental health specialist. So oftentimes you're the one initiating treatment. And to be honest, kids wanna see who they already know. And so they might see 
a psychiatrist who specializes in pediatrics, but they really prefer just to see you because they know you and they've been seeing you their whole life, right? And so oftentimes, not only are we making the diagnosis and initiating treatment, but you're doing treatment management um, and long-term as well. Also doing a lot of screenings for things like ADHD, initiating treatment for those kids as well. Uh, long gone is the day where all of those kids saw a specialist for treatment. Now that's really confined uh, within primary care. And of course, you're providing what we call anticipatory guidance or just really good education um, on things about how to prevent injuries in kids with families. Um, you know, what what kind of car seat are they supposed to use and when are they supposed to change that? And so you give all that information as well. So you really do a ton. Um, so what will you, how will you learn to do that here at Emory? So we have a pretty um, awesome team. Um, we really use kind of a team approach around here in pediatrics and we're a really strong team. I would say we're really known throughout the faculty as team peds, we kind of named ourselves team peds and they know who we are because we are really organized um, and we really work together to get things done. So I direct the PMP primary care program. Uh, Dr. Brown directs the acute care program, but you will see us both a lot. We, um, we do a lot of the lecture courses together. Uh, we co-coordinate those. She does about half the lectures. I do about half the lectures. And uh, so you'll get to see, see and meet us both and work with us both. And I think that makes our, our program stronger for that. Um, we also have a few other full-time faculty, uh, Dr. Sharon Close, who helps out a lot in the primary care program. She's at PMP in primary care, also has a lot of expertise in the area of genetics. Um, Lori Modley, who some of you may know from the pre-licensure program, um, she works with us as well on the post-licensure side. Um, also runs the, the farm worker project in Moultrie, Georgia for the pediatric side, uh, does a lot of work down there as well, and really has a big focus on uh, social justice and social determinants of health. Uh, Dr. Susan Brasher, again, many of you may remember from the pre-licensure side, um, also works with us, particularly around the areas of neurodevelopment and autism spectrum disorder, which is her focus for her research. Dr. Patricia Moreland, great expert in global health, also teaches quite a bit in the pre-licensure portion of the program, but definitely works with us as well around simulation and community engagement work that we do. Um, and then you see others listed here. I'm not gonna go through all of them because they kind of come in and out of the program, but you'll work with them quite a lot. Very formidable team. Uh, we also have Chris Calamaro, I'll point out, is the Director of Nursing Research at CHOA. Um, and then Maggie Payne actually is a PNP that owns and runs her own practice up in Dahlonega, Georgia. So a lot of really strong, amazing people. Um, most of these people listed, um, I would say starting with Teresa Kiplinger and down are actually former students of ours who have come back to teach in our program. So not only do we have great faculty, but we have great students and we recognize that you are an integral part of that team. Uh, you are not coming in as a blank slate. You know a lot of things. We learn probably as much from you as you do from us. Um, and that's kind of how we approach um, learning here. We try to use what's called a coach approach, which means um, basically I will give you what you need to learn, but you in the end are responsible for your learning, right? You have an ex extremely important role in this process. Um, so I'm not going home with you and reading the book to you, right? Um, but I'm giving you the chapters that you need to read and highlighting what areas are important in my lecture and then answering questions that you have, but you're still re highly responsible for getting, learning that information, however you learn that the best. Um, so <clears throat> definitely team up together. Um, we are there to coach you, but your job is to do the learning. Um, so our programs are um, moving to providing more online courses. Um, but we do offer on-campus intensives every semester. There's usually a couple of those um, every semester. Uh, you, of course, have those core MSN courses that you're in with all the other MSN students. But in addition to that, you have your pediatric-specific lecture courses and then pediatric-specific seminars. Sometimes you're in with acute care ped students, and sometimes it's just us. Um, so it varies based on the semester that we're in. You all are entering the MSN program. So our minimum clinical hours is 780 clinical hours. 
um, with uh, most of those being done in a pediatric primary care setting. Uh, for students who want, we can usually secure a specialty setting or urgent care ER rotation as well, but those tend to be smaller. Um, so remember your focus is pediatric primary care. That's where your training is focused. And so that's where the predominance of your clinical hours will be. It's different than pre-licensure. You precept one-on-one -on -one with a preceptor. Use a lot of different preceptors. Most are pediatric nurse practitioners, but we do have some physician partners that we work with as well. Um, so you'll get to work with a, a variety um, of healthcare professionals um, and learn kind of their way of doing things, which is nice um, to see different, different ways, different perspectives that people have. In addition to clinical hours, we also do offer simulation. Those are oftentimes done with the, during the intensives um, when you're here on campus. Um, done in the lab um, and, or in the classroom. Um, and then we also offer virtual simulation, which can be done from the comfort of your home um, on your own computer, um, but allows you to kind of go through cases and learn a little bit more, more directed learning. So I've listed these common questions. Um, so I'm just gonna hit on a couple and then I'm happy to address any comments and questions that you guys have. So usually a very common one is, can I work? and do this program full time. Yes, we have students who do that, but you're gonna know yourself the best um, and whether you can handle that or not. I will say if you work full time and are a full time student, um, you're probably gonna have work-life balance issues. Um, if you're willing to deal with that for four semesters, I think you can do it. You'll be awfully tired at the end. Um, and it will, there will be times where you will be frustrated um, because they want you at work and you made your schedule three months in advance. And then here I am saying, hey, I have a lab that I need you guys to do next month, right? And so there's always kind of like a tension balance there, um, but students do it. Um, I worked, I think I worked part time in my MSN program. And um, I think my last semester, I ended up leaving my job because I knew I was going to be transitioning anyway to an MP role. Um, so I, I've done it. Other people have done it. But there might be some people on the Zoom who are like, yeah, I'm a terrible multitasker. Um, I know myself enough to know that's not a good idea. And it's absolutely fine that I would say probably most of our students do not work. Um, so another question that kind of bleeds from that is if you are coming straight from the pre-licensure program and you don't have a lot of RN experience, can you still get a job after you graduate? The answer is yes. The majority of our students are actually um, students who come straight from their pre-licensure program and segue into our program. Now I can tell a difference probably the first semester, maybe a little bit into the second semester between those who have experience and those who don't. By the end of the program, I have no idea. You, you all kind of end up melding and looking the same. Um, most, as I mentioned, most of our students are those types of students and they find jobs. Um, they're not two years out not having a job. That's, that's not an issue that we've had. Um, you will find that in certain markets it might be saturated. So if you're looking for something in downtown Atlanta, you may not be able to find it. But if you go out to the suburbs or to other areas and you're flexible, um, you should be able to find a job. We, that has not been an issue for us um, as of yet. Um, there are residencies that are available for those who are leaving a um, pre-licensure program and coming straight in. We really caution people to not do those residencies if you want to be a full-time student here. Um, they're just very demanding. Uh, they need you there um, on a pretty strict schedule and it really conflicts a lot um, with our program schedule. Um, and uh, both are somewhat inflexible. I can't really rearrange a lab um, because, you know, your residency is requiring you to be somewhere. That lab is for everybody. Um, so it's difficult for me to do. I do try to give people lots of advanced warning that a lab is coming up like months in advance. Um, but I really, it's difficult for me to change things for one person. Um, and so what we found in students who have tried to do a full-time residency and go to school full-time is that their grades really start to slip. They're not getting the information that they need to get. Um, they're feeling bad about both situations, right? Because they want to be here and they want to be there and it's very difficult to manage. 
If you really insist on doing a residency, that's fine. Consider stepping out for a year uh, from our program or maybe going part-time um, is usually what we recommend. A lot of people ask, um, can I do a pediatric primary care program and then go work in a hospital or an acute care setting? You're not really trained to do that in the pediatric primary care program. You're trained to deliver care in pediatric primary care. Likewise, people who are in the acute care program are not trained to work in primary care settings. So do people do it? Yes. Are you gonna have like a huge learning curve when you get there? Absolutely. There may be also a time where they make you go back to school um, to get that specific certification. So if you are really interested in acute care and you think, well, I can go straight into the primary care, so I'll just do that and just go get a job in acute care, come talk to me, talk to Dr. Brown, um, we'll kind of make sure you have a plan to get you on the right track. And we can usually work with you. Um, if that's what you were thinking, we can usually work with you to make something happen. Um, but you're being trained in a specific way and acute carers are being trained in a different way. And it doesn't translate well to different settings. Um, I think that's, I'll stop there and see what kind of questions you guys have. Stop my share so I can see you in the chat here. So you feel free to unmute yourself. I'm a pretty casual person, um, like to have conversations, but if you feel shy today, you can certainly type in the chat box as well. One thing that's been a little difficult uh, reading over the website to glean is how exactly these classes fit into our normal classes. I mean, the ones that are specific to our pediatric primary care. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. So maybe I can talk about the first semester <clears throat> and it'll kind of help you a little bit. So in the first semester, you are taking pathophysiology. Um, you also take a course called becoming an APRN. So pathophysiology, obviously you're learning about pathophysiology, right? Um, it's a really pretty hardcore science course. Um, so just so you know that up front. Um, it, becoming an APRN is really about what is the nurse practitioner role? What does it look like? How do you get credentialing? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then at the same time, uh, you take a pediatric specific health assessment course um, and so you're in health assessment and you're learning specifically how to examine a child, how to, to get a history for a child. Um, and um, then and we have a lab component that goes along with that. So you get lots of practice time. Um, and then you also take a course called pediatric wellness. And in there, we're learning about how to do a well child exam, but also um, standards of care. So what do children eat at different ages? Um, how do you do a good mental health assessment on an adolescent, right? So a lot about nutrition, a lot about development. How do you do a developmental assessment? How do you interpret those? And then what do you do when there's something wrong, right? So it's that kind of standards of care, well care type information that you get in that course. Um, and then there's also a, a pediatric seminar that goes along with that course. So the um, pediatric wellness course is lecture, 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 and then you go into seminar and you do case studies on those topics and learn a little bit more. Um, and then we do have some clinical experiences the, right off the bat the first semester. Uh, usually they're more community based. Uh, so we go out to some head starts and you actually get to see children instead of your lab partner, right? <laughs> and learn that it's very different to look in your lab partner's ears than a two-year-old's ears. So you kind of get those some of those skills down as well. Um, we do offer these things called pet days where we bring kids into Emory and you get to examine them there as well. And then we also do some virtual um, simulation experience too. Um, so that's kind of your first semester. Um, so they, you know, you will use patho every single semester. So your second semester, your peds courses are on acute disease. And I teach the class where we talk about asthma. I'm supposed to be teaching you about diagnosing asthma and managing asthma. That's gonna go a whole lot easier if you learn from patho that the main problem with asthma is inflammation. Because then when I talk about using you know, inhaled steroids, you're like, oh yeah, 
that's addressing inflammation, right? And you have to be in farm that semester and maybe covered that content already. So it really kind of folds in together. Um, but that's kind of how it flows. Does that answer your question, William? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, sure. I have a question. Actually, I have two questions. Okay. Um, how generally how far do we have to travel for clinicals? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you live here um, in Georgia, <clears throat> the clinical placement office will find you a clinical. Um, their, their goal is to try to keep you at least in Georgia, but we do have some clinical, we have a lot that are in and around Atlanta. Atlanta is really big, right? It's not just the city limits. So it's a huge suburban metropolitan, metropolitan area. So we try to keep people within that area, but we do have some sites up in North Georgia, like in Rome or Dahlonega that are exceptional. I mentioned Maggie Payne earlier. She's up in Dahlonega. She's a nurse practitioner run clinic. That's just such an awesome experience up there. And she's just awesome, right? And then we have people down in Warner Robins who precept for us as well. And that's a really cool community because there's a military base there. So you get to see a really unique population. We also have placed sometimes students down in Augusta. We have a few sites down there as well. Um, and then we also have students who say, um, I really wanna do clinical in my home state with our courses being predominantly online with just you coming to campus for intensives, you can do that. Um, you would have to kind of work with a clinical placement office to figure out if you can do clinicals in your home state. There are a few states that won't allow you to do that. Um, but if you can do it in your state, then you kind of work to find um, a potential preceptor and then we kind of take care of the contract issues. Does that answer your question, Sparsha? Yeah, that is. Um, and my second question is, I'm also sort of a pre-licensure student. So um, what is like the deadline to have the NCLEX and the license and everything in? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so um, we have always had, and I don't think it's going to change, but we've always had a deadline of October. Um, so you need to, I think it's, it's, it has varied either October 1st or 15th or 31st. So sometime in October, uh, we like to have you have already completed your NCLEX exam. Um, and the reason for that is starting right away in the spring semester, you're out in a clinical setting and you can't be out there as a nurse practitioner student without have, being an RN. Um, they won't allow that. That's illegal. Um, so we would all get in trouble. So we try to get people to take it by October. Um, and we do that because occasionally we'll have students that struggle with the NCLEX and we'll need to take it again. And so that gives you a little bit of a cushion time to be able to retake it if you need it. Thank you. You're welcome. You guys can always reach out to me um, by email. Um, it's my name, but you can find me on the School of Nursing website because um, my name is kind of weird. I'll put it in the chat box too, um, <clears throat> but you can email me and ask me any additional questions. I'm also help, happy to kind of set up a um, Zoom meeting with you one-on-one, -on -one, answer any additional questions that you have. If you prefer to talk that way, I'm happy to do that too. Just let me know, we're excited. Thank you. Sure, thanks for coming. <clears throat> Thank you.